Welcome everybody tonight, Wednesday night service again. Uh, I've just been enjoying this time uh, where I can share with you some things that I really believe are important for the church today. Um, the series we've been in has been called The Church at the Inn. And so uh, I've been taking this study from the book of Revelations because of the book of Revelations, the first three chapters is uh, Jesus talking and he's talking to his church and he's telling his church exactly uh, what he expects from them and the things that are, they're going to go through. And, and so we're going to continue that study today. Last week, uh, we finished up Revelation chapter 1. And in there, uh, John, the apostle who wrote the book of Revelations, he, uh, he saw Jesus. Actually, it said that he was seeing and behind him was the voice and he saw Jesus, but he saw him in a totally different uh, light than he did when he walked in the surf. Many times when we worship, we have a picture of Jesus that's based on the gospel message because there's four gospels. We read those. We get a picture of Jesus uh, as the one who holds the children on his lap, you know, the one that gets tired, uh, and takes a nap at the front of the boat, things like that. John saw Jesus in a totally different way because now he is a resurrected Jesus uh, he's the exalted Jesus. He's the one that sits at the right hand of the Father. And when John saw him in this vision, uh, totally different, he saw Jesus, he described Jesus as the one with a, a golden band around his chest. He said that his head and his hair were uh, like wool, uh, white as snow, eyes as flames of fire. I can't even imagine what that would look like. Feet like fine brass and then a voice as a sound of many waters. So Jesus is totally different. In fact, and what it, what it caused John to do when he saw him, even though he knows Jesus and, and walked with him for three years, John falls down as dead because of just how amazing and awesome the presence of Jesus was. And again, he tells John immediately like that, don't be afraid. Kind of like John, I am the same Jesus. Even though I look this way, I am the same Jesus. But this is the Jesus that John describes as the one that we worship today and it's interesting then in the story when John saw Jesus <clears throat> he saw him walking among uh, seven golden lampstands and it says in his right hand were seven stars and we talked about that last week what that was let me just read this real quick a minute in Revelations 1 uh, 19 and 20 uh, Jesus is saying to John he says write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after this, the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, he says this, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. So Jesus is walking actually among the seven churches with what he says the angels uh, in his right hand, represented by seven stars. Now, we learned last week the angels was the Greek word angelos, which means messenger, which is talking about the messenger to the church, which would be the leadership, the pastor of the church. And so he's really, he has the pastor, the leadership of the church in his right hand as he's walking among the church. And so that was kind of what what John describes as kind of the setting uh, for this time. And now, then he goes into chapter two of revelations where jesus starts talking specifically to the seven churches of asia and the first church that jesus addresses is the church at ephesus let me just read this to you in revelation 2 1 he says to the angel of the church of ephesus write these things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands so jesus begins his address to this church in Ephesus, and he reminds the church, I walk among the churches. In other words, Ephesus, I know what's going on, and I'm right there with you, and I have the pastors of your church right in my right hand. And so, but I have a message to you, the church of Ephesus. And then John goes on to write what Jesus says. But let me just, before I go into the next part of this uh, chapter, I want to talk a little bit about the background of the city of Ephesus. I think it's interesting that all seven churches, he says it's the church at Ephesus, it's the church at Smyrna, it's the church at uh, Thyatira and Laodicea, um, because Jesus looks at the church in a city as being the like the gatekeepers of the city 
the ones that he called to reach that city. So this is the, the church at Ephesus. The background, though, in Ephesus, you need to really understand not just the background of Ephesus, but I'm probably going to give you background on all these churches because it helps you to understand what they're going through and then why Jesus said what he said to them. So Ephesus, uh, you probably don't know anything about the background, but Ephesus was a very, very large city in Asia Minor. Actually, it was the largest city, upwards of 500,000 people in that city. It was a port city. It was right on the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, and uh, Asia, by the way, is modern-day Turkey. So if you know on your map know where Turkey is, that's, that's where these churches were in that area, okay? So it was a, a port city on the uh, Mediterranean Sea, and that's where most of the... Um, uh, transportation came right through Ephesus when they was going into the land of Persia, which is actually Iran, Iraq, Greece, the Middle East, that whole area. Much of the transportation came through this port city of Ephesus. So it, that, for that reason, it was a very, very large city. It was also quite an upscale city in that it had running water. You probably don't, didn't know that. It had running water, indoor plumbing, hot and cold water. It actually had uh, a 24,000 seat theater in Ephesus, which actually um, can be seen today. If you ever visit that area, you can still see that theater today. Very, very, uh, again, large city, um, but it was also a very religious city, okay? There was a church there, but the religion of that church was not so much Christian. It was a pagan city. They had like 20 pagan temples there and um, they're very big into idolatry, into witchcraft. And I'm going to read a little bit about that um, in just a moment. Idolatry, witchcraft, sorcery, and prostitution was very rampant in the area. And it was connected with the religion of that area. And so that's kind of where this church is situated, right in the middle of all of that. So you kind of see the challenges that this church had. Uh, when the big thing was, it was known, Ephesus was known, for its famous temple of Artemis or Diana. You're going to read about that in just a minute because the book of Acts talks about that. Artemis was um, the goddess of fertility, okay? Artemis was the Greek name. Diana was the Roman name for the same god, this goddess of fraternity, okay? And the temple of Artemis was in Ephesus and is actually one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. That's how magnificent that temple was. And so for the believers there, uh, it was hard for the believers to even live separately from all the paganism that was going around them. I mean, all the activities, everything that was going around, uh, a converted Gentile believer would have it very difficult because of all the influences. You look at some of the influences today and how rough it is in, you know, in our country and around the world to be a believer today. It was very, very hard in that day because it was so rampant in the religion of that city, okay? But that is right where the seven churches are. I believe the seven churches were started by Paul probably about 30 years before that. The Bible says in Acts 19 that Paul took a group of 12 disciples, trained them in the school of Tyrannus, and he sent them out. And the Bible says, and they preached for two years and all of Asia heard the gospel. That's the area we're talking about. So Paul probably started these churches. John is there now writing to these churches. And so we see that uh, the fruit of Paul's ministry, now Jesus is addressing these churches. So let me just read some things. Uh, the people in Ephesus, the believers in Ephesus, you know, they were very strong in the paganism, but when they got saved, they went, they were all in. When, when Jesus came and changed their life, they were all in. Let me just read you this in Acts 19. You're going to see that they were very serious about their commitment to Jesus. This is what it says in Acts 19, starting verse 11. It says, Now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick, and diseases left them, and evil spirits went out of them. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits. See, they're a very spiritual city. Now you got Jews, they were trying to cast out demons in the city. Obviously, they had a spiritual mentality, but it was mostly occultic and demonic. And so he says, we, this is what those, those uh, exorcists said. They said, we exercise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. 
There were also seven sons of Sceva, which was a Jewish chief priest. That's amazing, a chief priest of the Jews who did this. And the evil spirits answered and said, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? I mean, that is just amazing to me because you need to know Jesus if you're going to walk in the power of Jesus. You just can't throw his name out there. They tried to do that. And the, and the demon said, hey, we don't know who you are. And what happened was this, verse 16, the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. But look what happened here. This became known both to Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus, okay? The city saw that, experienced that. So, wow, this Jesus is a powerful person. You can't just call his name. You need to know him. They even said, I know Jesus and I know Paul. But who are you? So they came, this became known, uh, and it says, and fear fell on all of them. This is on the believers in Ephesus. Fear fell on them, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And then look what they did. And many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds. Also, many of those whom practiced magic brought their books together, burned them, in the sight of all, and they counted up the value, and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. If you don't know what that is, that's a lot of money right there. So what they did is these believers, they were all in, but they had books and books and books on astrology and all that kind of stuff, and they threw them away, burned them, practicing magic, and it says the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. So this is what happened some 30 years before to this church in Ephesus. So this is a main, this is a big deal. So this is what now, John later is talking to the same church. They had a very good start in that they were totally committed. In fact, even in, the Bible says, I've read, I'm going to continue reading here a little bit in Acts 19. The ministry of Paul in Ephesus, because the believers there were so committed, it um, affected the economy of Ephesus. Let me read you this in verse 23 of Acts 19. And about this time there arose, grows a great commotion about the way. The way is talking about what Paul, the, the gospel. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines of Diana. Again, I mentioned Diana, the goddess of fertility. He made silver shrines which brought no small profit to the craftsmen. He called them together with the workers of similar occupation and said, men, you know that we have our prosperity by this trade. Moreover, you see and hear that not only at Ephesus, but throughout almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away many people, saying that they are not gods which are made with hands. So not only is this trade of ours in danger of falling into disrepute, but also the temple of the great goddess Diana, may be despised and her magnificence destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worship. See, so now you kind of get in the background. They worship this goddess Diana through all of this area, all of these churches. The gospel came in and it started affecting the economy of those people who were building, making idols and shrines to this, okay? So the gospel was powerful in doing a major work in this city of Ephesus some 30 years before. And now Jesus is coming back to this church and is speaking to them. In books. So now here we're going to read again John, or excuse me, John, when you talked about in Revelations 2. Let's read Revelations 2, 1 to 7. Jesus addressing this church, and he says this To the angel of the church of Ephesus, write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. You have tested those who say they are apostles and are not and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored. Again, twice he says labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Look at this. Jesus looked and that this was the church of Ephesus. You can see now 30 years later, they are still doing a good work. They are still proclaiming the gospel. They are still coming against those who are saying they're an apostles or not, which would be a false teacher coming in. They're dealing with heresy in that city. They're surrounded by all this paganism, and I'm sure because of all the paganism around them, they're trying to say, hey, we're not going to let that in our church. And so they're dealing with that. But in verse 4, God says this. This is what Jesus says in verse 4. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works or else 
I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. But this you have. Now he goes back again to what he likes about this. But this you have. You hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Okay, so let me just go a couple minutes here. The positive things Jesus said. All right, we already mentioned here, he liked their work ethic, okay? You know something? The church needs to be busy working in the gospel, okay? We're not here to sit back and just wait for Jesus to come back. We're here to be busy and ready and working up until the time Jesus uh, comes in the Easter sky. When Jesus comes back, he's coming back for a church that is spotless and blameless and a church that is working. They did that very, very well. Also, it mentions here that they did not tolerate false doctrine, again, with the apostles and also with the, uh, the teachings of the Nicolaitans. So I'm just, the Nicolaitans, if you don't know who they are, you wouldn't understand this. I want to mention what they are because the Nicolaitans were a group of people that uh, is um, noted. Church history says that they were actually followers of one of the seven deacons in the book of Acts chapter 6. You can go there if you want, book check. Acts chapter 6, they, had, they chose seven deacons uh, that would help do some of the work of the ministry so the apostles could focus on prayer and teaching the word. One of those seven was a guy named Nicholas, and he was a proselyte from Antioch, and Antioch was from this area. So Nicholas, being a proselyte, he was involved in all that paganism of that area. He got uh, converted into Judaism, and then he got converted into Christianity, and he was one of the sevens. But church history said that he ended up going back into heresy, and that's what happened here with this, uh, uh, this deeds of the Nicolaitans. They're from this guy named Nicholas. And so because he was into paganism, what he did is he brought this back into the church. And let me just read you a quote from Rick Renner about this guy, Nicholas. And this is what Rick Renner said. Rick Renner is a Bible scholar, a Greek scholar. He says this, According to the writings of the early church leaders, Nicholas taught a doctrine of compromise, implying that total separation between Christianity and the practice of the occult paganism was not essential. Basically, it's okay to kind of blend the two together. Okay, I'm looking and thinking, don't we do that in the church today? It's okay to live a little bit in the world, a little bit here, and you blend this together? That's what he did. Uh, um, from early church records, it seems apparent that this Nicholas of Antioch was so immersed in occultism and Judaism, because he was a proselyte to Judaism and Christianity, that he had a stomach for all of it. He had no problem intermingling these belief systems in various concoctions and saw no reason why believers couldn't continue to fellowship with those still immersed in the black magic of the Roman Empire and its countless mystery cults. And so that was what the deeds of the Nicolaitan was. But let me just say, that is something that Jesus said, I hate. I just want to let you know, Jesus hates a church that mingles things of the world and things of God together. And we need to know that, okay? Because if there's things that you're dealing with that are still from the old life, that's not what Jesus wants for his church. He's coming for a spotless church, a blameless church. The church is above reproach, okay? Jesus made us righteous. He expects us to walk in the righteousness that he gives us, okay? The righteousness he gives us gives us the ability to walk in his righteousness. And if we're not doing that, if we are still mingling the old with the new, we do that by choice. And it's something that we need to deal with. Jesus hates that. And this church was good at dealing with that. So they had no... Um, what's the word I'm looking? Uh, they would not tolerate. They had no tolerance for the paganism in the church. Yet in the midst of all the good that they were doing, Jesus said this. Again, nevertheless, I have this against you that you have left your first love. And, it, and it, it's possible, I don't know for sure, but it's possible that because this church focused so much on making sure they don't get involved in the paganism of that day, they forgot what's really important. And we do that sometimes even in the church today. That, you know something, uh, we're not going to allow this and we're not going to allow that. But hey, let's understand here. Uh, even some people that are coming in new, they may bring some stuff in that they got to deal. We got to have 
grace for those who are coming in new, but not have grace for those who are trying to teach and bring the stuff in. And that's sometimes a fine line for a church to walk. But uh, so, I mean, so it's a good thing to have sound doctrine, but we still need to love one another. So they were strong in some areas and weak in that area of love. I just want to say this, love is the greatest gift that the church can give to the world. And so don't ever take what is the main thing and not keep it as the main thing, okay? Love needs to be the main thing. It says in 1 Corinthians 13, if you have all uh, faith, in, uh, you know, to move mountains but have not love, you are nothing. And so love needs to be the main thing. So that's what he did in this church. And it's interesting that Jesus said, if you don't deal with this and repent, I may have to take your lampstand from you, okay? So that's how serious this is. He's not saying, hey, just kind of work on that a little bit and I'll come back and talk to you later. No, he says, you need to deal with this. Remember from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works because they were a church that was loving in the past. In fact, if you read Ephesians 1, 15, Paul talking to the church at Ephesus, he says this, Paul says this to the Ephesian church, therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, and your love for all the saints. And then he goes on and he explains. But what Paul addresses them, he says, I know of your faith and I know of your love. They were noted as the church that loved the saints, that loved people. Jesus knew that. He says, those were your first works. But you've fallen out of that and you've got so, uh, so into all these other good things. See, sometimes the good things you're into are not the best things, okay? Keep doing the good things. Don't stop doing that, but bring in what's important and do it all in love. So that's the message for today. I think that's a great message for the church today. We need to not compromise and let the world in, but we need to keep love as the main thing. Stand your ground in all the doctrinal truths, but keep love the main thing. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. That's how much God loves us. Love is the main thing. So there's the message for today. Thank you so much for listening. I appreciate it. I hope you're enjoying this series on the church at the end. Next week, we'll go into the next church. Jesus has a lot to say to the church. These are good. This is what we need for the day that we're living in. So be blessed. Love you. We'll see you next week.